Hello YouTube, uh, this is a man on a mission, and today I'm going to be talking about the ideas behind gravity essentially, or maybe a possible competing theory, if you can call it that, which is that the Earth is accelerating upward towards you instead of you accelerating downward toward the Earth. So then, let's get started. Um, I'd like to point out to start that my purpose of this video is not necessarily going to be to disprove the fact that the Earth does not accelerate upwards. Uh, the main purpose of it is actually just to show how science functions in general. Uh, often I do not believe that most people uh, on a daily basis truly acknowledge and appreciate how much work is put into science and the ideas and the philosophies behind it. Um, so I'm going to be talking about acceleration, speed, velocity, and position. I'm going to be defining all those terms for you guys today. I'm going to explain what free fall is, uh, the background behind why I came up with the idea for the Earth accelerating upward uh, as sort of a test to see how science works. Uh, then I'm also going to disprove this same idea. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, this idea is not solely held by me. I know there are some fringe groups like uh, flat earth theorists, I think is what they call themselves, that also believe that, well, some of them believe that the earth is actually accelerating upward. They also believe it's a flat disk. So uh, let's start defining our physics terms with position. So position is just a measurement value. So a length normally from one point to another. And the first point that we measure from, we arbitrarily always set as zero. So and a good example of this would be to measure from the leftmost point of the green arch to the rightmost point on the red rectangle. And if we do that, we'll notice that it's one, two, three, four tick marks long. So in this case, from the leftmost part of the arch to the rightmost part of the rectangle, there is four tick marks long. So that's what we would consider its position to be, is four tick marks. Uh, velocity is actually defined based off of position, and what velocity is, is it's how much distance did you cover in a given amount of time. Uh, a good example of this would be your speedometer on your car, although it actually is speed, because velocity has an associated direction with it. A uh, speedometer of a car it works well because it's in miles per hour. Your distance unit is your miles, and you divide it by the amount of hours it takes to do the number of miles that you have done and you will get your velocity off of that. Acceleration is defined in a very similar way. You take the amount of velocity that you've changed. So if you went from five miles an hour to six miles an hour in a time interval of one second, you would have an acceleration of one meter per second squared. You take your change in velocity and you divide it by your time interval in which you're measuring. To help you get a more intuitive sense of how acceleration is related to velocity, Let's take a general problem. So let's say that I started at rest and I accelerate at five meters per second squared or five meters per second per second. And I will accelerate for one second. How fast will I be going at the end of this one second mark? Well, the answer is fairly simple. If you think about this, I am changing my speed five meters per second every second. So if I've moved one second further into time, I will be moving at 5 meters per second. Or another way to do this more mathematically is multiply the acceleration times the time change, which will yield your final velocity. So to double check to make sure you grasp this concept, if I continue moving uh, after 20 seconds, how fast will I be going? And I should note that I started at rest at the beginning of these 20 seconds, and I'm still accelerating at 5 meters per second per second. Uh, please post your answer in the comments. Let's talk about the background behind this problem. So free fall in classical physics is when you drop an object and you watch it fall back to the earth. Well, it turns out that all objects, no matter their weight or their mass, will all experience the same acceleration. So I can drop a toothpick, I can drop an elephant, I can drop a feather, I can drop a brick and they should all fall at the same rate as long as they do not have any resistive forces like uh, air resistance. And this number that they all fall at, or the, the acceleration or rate at which they fall, 
is been fairly accurately measured at 9.8 meters per second per second or 9.8 meters per second squared. Everything, no matter the object, will fall at this rate towards Earth. So here comes the question that started this whole video. How do we know that everything's falling towards Earth? Why can't the Earth be speeding up towards any falling or object that we consider to be falling? So why doesn't isn't it that when you throw a ball up, the Earth doesn't rush up to meet it instead of the ball rushing back down to the Earth? Well, it turns out that we can use science and extrapolation to figure out which one of these models better fits our reality. We can come up with a list of assumed principles and then apply these principles to a physical situation. The end result of applying these principles to the physical situation will tell us whether or not the model holds up to observations we make about the natural world around us. So for the first hypothetical situation we're going to create, we're going to assume that the Earth is spherical. We're also going to assume that the kinematic equations are correct. These equations are pretty strong and foundational because they're rooted in calculus and all mathematics can be proven. And they're also rooted in the idea that math can be applied to the physical world, which shows up in business and accounting and all sorts of other areas. We're also going to assume that the Earth accelerates and not the object that is falling. So let's make a, a model up or physical situation. Let's look at these guys sitting on the Earth here. One is person A on the opposite end of the Earth as the person B on the other end. So if person A has to experience an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second per second, then that means that person B is going to be left out into space because he's staying stationary with respect to the coordinate system, which is the white background. But this poses a problem. That would mean that half the Earth at all times is flying away from the other half. And we don't observe this. So let's make it the Earth instead accelerate towards person B. Well, if we made the Earth accelerate towards person B, now person A is getting stranded into space. This is, once again, the same problem. So for this model to work, we'd have to have the Earth expanding radially, which means that distance between you and grandmother's house is getting farther away every single day, which does not co confirm with what we observe in nature. So we know that this is not happening. So since the other model didn't work, let's change our assumptions. Let's keep the Earth being spherical, but let's kick out the part where the Earth has to accelerate towards the person. Uh, instead, let's say that there's a force called gravity, and that it draws things that have mass or any sort of matter together. Uh, and it's given by Newton's equation, f is equal to g m1 m2 over r squared. This helps us account for the reason why things fall in radially because th this force always acts towards the center of mass, and the center of mass of Earth is the center of Earth. Now let's re-envision the same situation with person A and B. We'll notice that this time both of them are accelerating at 9.8 meters per second per second inward towards the center of the Earth. In fact, no matter where you place these two people, they'll always be now accelerating inward instead of having one person flying off into space or the Earth having to expand. Because we don't have to come up with any sort of wacky ideas like the Earth expanding, and this also fits our reality, um, we consider this to be a much stronger idea than the previous one. And we can toss out the old model and adopt this one as our new one. So we found one model that works, but this doesn't get at the heart of one of the models that I wanted to show and disprove. Um, let's take the model that is often held, or sometimes held I should say, by flat earth people. And that is that this flat earth disk is accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second per second. The reason why I give this number is because this is the same number we continually measure things falling at here on earth. So in order for their model to fit data, it has to accelerate up at this amount. So here's our assumption for this one. The Earth has to be flat. 
kinematics still have to work because they're rooted in mathematics and they still are going to be applied towards physics. The mathematics portion is still going to be applied towards physics. And now let's tack on there that the Earth is accelerating upward at 9.8 meters per second per second. So if we assume this, then we can look at this picture here, which shows a man sort of standing sideways. We can kind of pretend that the image is flipped or rotated, and that the Earth is accelerating upwards, which is the x direction in this case, at 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, if this was happening, then we can actually use this uh, example to calculate how fast the Earth would have to be moving, or this flat disk shape would have to be moving, given a certain time interval. Um, so all we really have to do is we have to go from our previous assumptions, the, particularly the one where the kinematic equations still work, and the acceleration of the flat Earth, and we can calculate this velocity at any time. To help demonstrate how science and physics and particular requires um, justification for our equations. I'm going to actually go through and derive how we can come to the equation v is equal to the acceleration times the change in time. So let's start out with the definition of acceleration given in velocities terms, which would be that it's the, the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Well, we can use separation of variables here and get the dv by itself and get the dt on the other side. From here, we can integrate from the velocity initial to the velocity final. Uh, dv is equal to the integral from the time initial to the time final of a multiplied by dt. And when you do this um, integral, you'll get velocity final minus the velocity initial is equal to the acceleration multiplied by the change in time. Well, if you move over the velocity initial and we set it equal to zero because we're going to consider the flat earth to be starting at a zero value at time equals zero, then we get the equation, the velocity final is equal to the acceleration multiplied by, by the change in time, which happens to be the same equation most people who've taken physics will recognize and notice. So this is just to show how science requires justifications for all of its equations that it, it produces. Let's get back to the, the question at hand, which is how fast will this flat earth or pizza-like shape be moving upward uh, after a certain period of time? Well, let's calculate how fast it would be moving after one hour from starting this acceleration. Well, after one hour, which happens to equal to 3,600 seconds, it'd be moving at a speed of three, uh, sorry, 35,280 meters per second. And this was formulated by taking the time of one hour and multiplying it by 9.8 meters per second per second. So then we do a similar process for one day. And that turns out that the final velocity after one day is 846,720 meters per second. And after a year, it's a giant number that happens to actually be faster than the speed of light, which comes to how we disprove this. So we know from experiments that the speed of light is constant, and we've actually measured this constant to be 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Well, given that after one year, this Earth would have to be traveling faster than this, which is against all of our known knowledge right now of physics, uh, this isn't possible this flat earth pizza-like thing could not be moving this fast. Uh, it would violate um, one of Einstein's equations, which would mean that it would have to have an essentially an infinite amount of energy, which isn't possible. The numbers gathered on the previous slide don't meet the requirement that no object can move faster than the speed of light, which is violating something that's pretty well known in physics. And since it's violating this, we're going to have to discard this idea entirely. Uh, I'm not going to try and present any other model that might justify this flat earth model. Um, it's probably likely that it won't pass the rest of laws of physics. Uh, you can probably try and make one up, and then if you extrapolate it a little bit, it should probably, it, it, it will most likely violate uh, a known law of physics. It's just how much extrapolation that needs to be done to do this. And I actually encourage everyone to try and come up with more models because the more you extrapolate, the better you're going to have an understanding and an appreciation for how science works. 
I'd like to thank everyone for listening to this. Uh, this has been a man on a mission. See you next time.